Uh, our, our third speaker this morning is Dr. J Jason Fleming. Uh, he has served as the development coordinator for the ADSERT Coastal Ocean Model since 2005 and has worked on every part of that code during that time. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, he was chosen to develop key ADSERT features to support real-time ADSERT model guidance for tropical cy cyclones. Dr. Fleming is also the lead developer and operator for the ADSERC Surge Guidance System, a software automation system for ADSERC that he operated in real time for official decision support during the Deepwater Horizon event, as well as hurricanes Gustav, Irene, Isaac, Sandy, Harvey, Irma, and Maria. In 2010, Dr. Fleming founded the ADSERC Boot Camp an annual three-day training event for teaching and learning in the AdCERC model community. The title of his talk is Real-Time AdCERC Modeling for Coastal Zone Decision Support. Jason. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for inviting me today. Um, I'm here, uh, you probably are all aware that the times are changing when it comes to uh, coastal flooding. Um, Miami, downtown Miami, now floods at high tide, just at high tide, on a regular basis. Um, Ellicott City, Maryland, had a what they called a thousand year flood. That means it's a point zero zero one chance of a flood that severe in any given year, and they had two and three years. Um, Hur Hurricane Harvey uh, went from nothing to a category four storm uh, in two days and made landfall in Corpus Christi wandered through Texas and dumped 50 inches of rain on Houston in four days, wandered back offshore, re-strengthened, and then hit Louisiana. Uh, Boston this year, we had four nor'easters in four weeks, and they had the worst storm surge they've ever had. Uh, and in North Carolina, we had Hurricane Floyd, uh, and they said it was a 500-year storm, and then Hurricane Matthew 20 years later. So um, those are the kind of the, some of the driving forces behind uh, what we're doing with the AdSERC modeling. And for this, uh, winds and, and the waves and the uh, water levels, the hydrodynamics are, uh, we're not doing it to, to drive another model like the water quality model that, that you all are doing in the realms community, um, but it's hydrodynamics for their own sake and for, for planning and for decision support. So I hope it's still exciting even though we don't have a water quality angle at this, for, for this particular talk. So a little bit about the AdSERC model. It is a finite element model. It runs in uh, the 2D depth integrated hydrostatic shell water equations. It also can be run in 3D barotropic and baroclinic mode. It is an unstructured model. Uh, everything I'm gonna show you today is, is the 2D depth integrated because we're working on horn, uh, storm surge and, and flooding from rainfall and um, or from rivers. And uh, we have the advantage that FEMA uses the AdSERC model to, to compute flood insurance rate maps. So they make a lot of AdSERC meshes that we can later use. So they do it for planning purposes and we use those, those meshes in real time. Friction is a key issue for the, for the hydrodynamics and we do use land use, land cover data for uh, computing meaning zen for AdSERC. For the, that's, so that's friction of the water against the bottom. We also look at friction of the air against the, uh, the wind against the surface. Uh, this is a showing uh, directional wind reduction. Uh, you can imagine if you're staying on a point uh, where there's no tree cover uh, and there's trees to, to the east, that if the wind is blowing from the east, you're not going to feel much wind, but if the wind is blowing from the west, you're going to feel the full force of it. And so that's important for competing storm surge. And so we have uh, a 12, uh, 12 directional wind reduction scheme that also uses land, land use and land cover. On the land itself, uh, AdSERC has a lot of features for uh, representing things that will hold the water back, either hold the water back when it's coming in or in terms of rainfall, uh, hold the water back instead of and not let it drain out. So this is, uh, this is Lake Pontchartrain, this is the Mississippi River, uh, and this is a small island called Grand Isle uh, offshore in Louisiana. And Grand Isle has a frontal dune running along the front of it. This is what the ladder looks like. So we want to represent that frontal dune, but as you know, you don't want to drive your resolution down any tighter than, than it needs to in order to, compute the, in order to compute the answer. So we don't want to have to have an AdSERC mesh that runs up and, up and down that dune and has several points across the dune. Uh, so if you wanted to represent that in your unstructured mesh, one, this is one way to do it. You can just lift up the nodes that are along that, that dune, and, uh, but I'm not sure physically how that would, if the numerics would turn out very well. 
So AdCERC has uh, internal barrier boundaries that can be used to represent barriers like this. And uh, what we find is that roadways and railroad beds also look just like levees. And so, uh, in terms of the hydrodynamics, so you can re represent those subgrid scale features in AdCERC with these internal barrier boundaries without actually having to, to represent it in the, in the topography. So um, this is what sort of a 3D view of what the um, mesh looks like. Um, so uh, you see these internal barrier boundaries, uh, one here and running along the front here. This is a river flow, a uh, levied river flowing in. And so this, uh, I think we're stuck here for some reason. Yeah, can somebody advance that manually? So it's an internal barrier boundary, it's not meshed over, there's no discretization that goes across it. AdCERC will um, determine the water level at the front of the barrier, and uh, if, it, if it rises above the barrier, it'll compute a flux that goes between two nodes that are paired. But it's actually not through the domain, but it's just calculating the flux and it goes across. So... Oh, there's another question in the back. So, so the front of the boundary, does it decay over time? Um, we have the ability to change those over time, uh, yes, so uh, you can make a change on a schedule. Actually, the reason why was those boundaries can be changed were, was for a project to show levee failure. So you can just have it go down, you can have it fail when the water level gets to a certain height. It can also be used to show floodgates opening and closing. Um, we did a lot of work in New Orleans and they have 500 floodgates, they have to open and close. It's kind of like conducting a symphony when there's a storm coming. And so they want to be able to simulate, you know, what is the storm surge going to be if we close this gate? What is it going to be if we leave it open? So you can do it on a schedule or at a certain time or when the water level gets to a certain height. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, Larry. Could you refresh me? How, how, old, how mature are models? Like? Yeah. When did it start? Uh, it started in the late 90s, or mid, uh, early 90s, I'm sorry. I've, I've been working on it since 98 and um, my first job was actually merging the 2D and 3D versions, and so um, uh, it started in 92, I think, was sort of the first release version. Wait, was it an academic model first? Or? Yes, it still is. It still is. Yes? Yes. So does the 3D version resolve those internal boundaries in a normal way or um, well, you can mesh over those internals. Where we had those internal barrier boundaries, you can just mesh over that dune. Uh, and AdCERC in 3D has, uh, you can do sigma, or you can do z, or you can do hybrid vertical coordinates. So if you wanted to, to have a 3D go over that, you could do that. Any other questions? I think we've just about got her back up. I'll just go a little bit faster so that we can still make our time. <laughs> Not your fault. <laughs> Nothing like getting a talk up under pressure. Well, we do this in real time, and, and um, so we always have uh, a plan B, and, and we always uh, try to stay cool when things go wrong. We say almost <laughs> always something goes wrong.
All right. supposed to be an animation, but if it doesn't animate it, it doesn't matter. This one right here? The one, the one that's up there right now. There you go. There you go. Uh, so you can see when the water lifts up above the boundary that there's actually a hole in the water surface, and that's because there's no actual mesh there. So this is just kind of a, a cartoon. This is a, a test problem that we have showing storms, you know, storm surge coming in, and it uh, goes over this levee right here and fills up this back bay. Uh, and then when the water recedes, that's all been sort of dammed up in there and uh, you can't get out. So that's the cartoon version of, of how AdCERC works for storm surge problems. The manual lead band Oh, there we go. Okay. So that's, that was the model that uh, the Corps of Engineers was using to redesign the levee systems in New Orleans because they knew they had a problem. This is the early 2000s, 2002, 2003, 2004. Uh, so they're using this, they had all their um, up-to-date levee heights in there. This is like Pontchartrain. This is, uh, these are the levees, this Mississippi River is totally channelized within the levees. These are all the canals that they have. Um, this is 17th Street Canal, Orleans Avenue, London Avenue canals. Those canals, if you're in New Orleans and you go to the, to the levees that, that bank those canals, you don't look, you know, you're not looking at the water. If you're in the city, you're not looking down at the water. You're looking up at the water. You actually see barges go past you over your head. That's how, that's how far below sea level the city is. And so if you want to see the water, you have to climb up the levee to actually get back to sea level. So they, they, they use those three canals to pump rainwater out of the city because they didn't have a way to get rainwater out of the city, it would just fill up. So uh, when Hurricane Katrina came, they were still doing these design studies. And at the time the storm came, they didn't have these results available for the storm. They only had what the Hurricane Center was giving, which at the time was much lower resolution, and it didn't contain any timing information, which is what they need to make decisions about how to open those gates. So after the storm hit, uh, and the reason why this, the flooding was so bad was not because the levees were overtopped, it was because the levees actually failed. Once one of those levees fails, the city just fills up and there's nothing you can do to stop it. And so um, these levees failed and so the Corps of Engineers said, well, we can't reinforce all these levees, it's, it's too much, it's going to take too long, so we're going to put hydraulically actuated gates at the, at the mouths of those three canals. And uh, in 2006, they decided they needed uh, support, they wanted uh, real-time model guidance from AdCERT. They wanted the high resolution, they wanted the timing information, they wanted the up-to-date levee heights. And the, at the time, these gates weren't finished yet. They're going to have to be lowered in place by tall cranes if there was a storm. So they wanted to know from us, uh, we want you to run this code in real time, we want you to tell us the wind speed, because these cranes can't operate in high wind, and the water level at the mouths of those three canals. And so I was a, um, I was a uh, graduate or a postdoc at the time and uh, so I got tapped on the shoulder and this is May and they said ask be ready for hurricane season on June 1st. So AdCERT had never had an operational like automation system before so we started writing it from scratch. One of the things you need when you're doing hurricanes uh, is uh, you need winds to, to drive your model and H wharf is, is a great you know GFS those are all great gridded wind fields but the problem with those is that um, they're not the official word of the National Hurricane Center. So when, when they're making the decisions, they want to know if it follows the official track, what am I looking at? And, those, and the official track doesn't follow any particular model. So, um, but the problem with the official track is it's just a set of parameters. It's just the maximum wind speed and, and some information about the shape of the storm. The, the Hurricane Center doesn't produce a grid wind field. So we needed to um, take what they, they had in terms of parameters and uh, turn it into a, a grid wind field. Uh, this is supposed to be an animation also, but it doesn't matter. So what we do is, uh, looking at, the, at a storm, you can look at it like, a curve, like it's uh, just a simple curve fit where the, the winds are zero at the center at the eye. They rise very quickly in the eye wall to the maximum wind speed, and then they taper off later. And the Hurricane Center gives information about uh, the, the shape of the storm and the asymmetry and the way that it tapers off. And the stronger the storm is, the more information you get. 
And the great thing about that is that the fact that it's a set of parameters, inside AdCERC we generate all the, all the wind speeds and all the barometric pressures from those parameters. And if somebody wants a what-if scenario, like what if the storm veers right, you know, more towards us, or, or what if the storm like Ike was getting bigger and smaller as it went, what if the storm is, is larger? What about Harvey with the rapid intensification scenario? Those things would be hard to do if we were working with the gridded wind field, but if with a parameterized wind field, it's a lot easier. So this is a summary of the system. We start with the National Hurricane Center Forecast Advisory. They tell us the official track, and we have information based on historical forecast statistics about the cone of uncertainty. Um, we turn that into a, a, a vortex in, with, uh, inside AdCERT. And then we produce these hydrographs at those three. This is how we started. We just made hydrographs at those three locations. And the whole automation system runs on a supercomputer with AdCERC, and it does all the post-processing, draws all the graphs, and it was, would send emails to the engineers, the US Army Corps of Engineers, with the results. So that was the system that we were sort of had in, starting in 2006, and 2006 was quiet, and 2007 was quiet, and then we got to 2008. And um, we had Hurricane Gustav, which was the first major event after Katrina for Louisiana. And right after that made landfall, we were looking at Anna and Ike and Josephine, this sort of train of, of storms coming at us. And during Gustav, uh, we sort of had a real tight scope of work. They said they want these three locations, and they want uh, wind and water level, and that's it. And so that's what we went with, and everything was sort of coded for that. But what we found was that we would give them, we would send them these graphs and they would immediately come back and say, well, there's another location that we're interested in, we want data for. Well, we've got this Harvey Canal on the west bank of the Mississippi River and we want to know whether to close that gate. Can you give us water levels there? And so I always tell people, we don't do operational modeling. Operational modeling has a very specific meaning when, the, when NOAA delivers a model into operations that are legally not allowed to touch it for two years. So if you have a question about what if the storm does this or that, they, they can't modify the way that their system runs. We had a decision to make. Are we going to tell them, no, you know, the Harvey Canal is not in our scope of work, maybe we'll look at it next year, or are we just gonna do whatever they want us to do uh, to, so that they can make the decision? So I tell people, well, we're not operational, we're real time. That means the model runs in real time, but we also respond in real time. If you have a new problem or a new question or you need clarification, we can modify our system in real time. And so I was working on it live. It was 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. And they, they, between advisories, they wanted new locations. And so I wrote, rewrote my post-processing system. And you know, one typo, and then nothing runs, and then they don't have any graphs for the briefing, right? So it's like the pressure's on. So I thought, okay, I, I was hard-coded for those three locations, so I rewrote it to add three more locations. And then the next advisory comes out. They come out every six hours. The next advisory comes out and they say, well, here's five more locations we want you to look at. So I rewrote it again and uh, it was an absolute nightmare. Absolute nightmare. And so, um, but you know, we just did whatever we could do to try to get them the information they needed. So after that, oh, and, and then not only that was Ike was coming. And so Ike was crossing the Gulf and the people in Texas said, well, we have a different computer and we have a different mesh and we have our own custom version of AdSert. But can you do here in Texas what you just did for, um, for Louisiana with Gustav? And I said, yes. And then uh, Ike was called, like Ponch Train had filled up, and Ike was causing more impacts in, in Louisiana than Gustav did. It was 200 miles offshore. And so they said, no, no, we need, we need you back here. And so it was like trying to ride two bicycles at once. <laughs> so I said, Let's, this hard-coded stuff where we think we know what we're going to need before we start is not the way to do this. Uh, we need a, a total rethink this. Um, we need a system that is reliable, capable, collaborative, because we can't do it alone. Uh, pluggable, relocatable, compatible, visible. We we're emailing people hydrographs. That was not, that was not going to cut it. Um, flexible, credible, uh, scalable, and accurate. And credible and accurate are not the same, not the same thing. So this is what we were working with now. This is our, our collaborative we, uh, these are all sites that host the, the AdSERC Surge Guidance System, which, which is just a software that I wrote around AdSERC to make it run uh, automatically. So we have the University of Texas, Louisiana State University, uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, the Renaissance Computing Institute. Our local collaborator for the Mid-Atlantic is at George Mason University, it's also Ferrer, I don't know if you know him. 
but I'll talk about him uh, more towards the end of the talk. Uh, NOAA, CSDL, and NCEP run ADSERC and the ASGS for the National Hurricane Center during the storm, but they don't release that. So um, that's not available to the public, but the Hurricane Center is looking at this data as well. Uh, we've recently added uh, Florida Institute of Technology and University of Central Florida. In terms of visibility, we have a, this website in 2008, right after Gustav, we said we need something better than emailing header drafts to people. And so this is uh, at the URL, sierra.coastalrisk.live. And this is a web mapping interface. It's not just for AdCERC, and it's not just for storm surge, and it's not just for hydrodynamics. It can have any kind of geospatial data in it. So if you want a really cool, fancy website for your data uh, here in the Chesapeake, uh, you can contact uh, the folks at LSU, and there's a sign-up button that you can get more information and, uh, and, uh, and collaborate. Relocatable, uh, we were all hard-coded back in 2008 for one location. We want to be able to drop in any mesh. So uh, within an hour, we can get a new mesh going and uh, get start producing results. This is the FEMA Region 2 mesh for New York and New Jersey. Portable and scalable, we don't, you know, it's, don't you hate codes where you have, if you want to change something, you have to actually go through the source code and go, oh, I got to change this, and this needs to be a little bit different, and this other parameter has to change. So we wanted something where everything that was related to the machine you were running on is all in one file, and you just, when you start running on a new machine, you say, okay, this is, here are the little idiosyncrasies for that machine, and it's all isolated. So it makes it easy to relocate from one supercomputer to another. Uh, flexibility. Uh, we take in the information, river flow data, hurricane vortex parameters, meteorological data, tides, and we can produce Google Earth, we can produce, uh, we can post to an OpenDAP server. Uh, we do this every day, we send out email notifications, we generate GIS shape files of our results, and we can post it to uh, the SIR website. Oops. Flexibility, so uh, during Hurricane Isaac, so this is kind of just an illustration about how we we're able to achieve flexibility. We have four different meshes running Hurricane Isaac on two different computers, and each one has a different forecast ensemble. So the forecast ensemble is, is a what-if scenario. Uh, we do scenario-based modeling. We don't do probabilistic modeling. Uh, and scenario-based uh, is sort of the other half of the story. If you're just looking at slosh and the probabilistic modeling, you're only, only getting half the story. The other half of the story is the scenario-based modeling where we show if it goes on the official track, here's what you're looking at. If it veers to the right, here's what you're looking at. And people, those scenarios uh, help the information become actionable. So we do, this is an example of that. Uh, in terms of compatibility, the, there's a MATLAB program that was funded by the National Hurricane Center. It's called Storm Surge Viz, and uh, that looks at the same metadata. It looks at the same open app server to, uh, to get results, and this, is, this MATLAB code is all posted on GitHub as well. And this is not just restricted to AdCERC either. Uh, the NIHOPS, which is a version of Palm, which also does Storm Surge, uh, can be viewed uh, with this as well. Accuracy, we're on our third generation wind model. We started out with, a, I wrote the first symmetric vortex model in 2006 for ADSERT. So that's that curve fit. Uh, it was very simple. Um, uh, and uh, we're on our third generation now. We use all the shape information provided by the National Hurricane Center. Uh, and our fourth generation is coming up. We're going to be including land interaction effects as well. So when the deep water horizon blew up, uh, every, we we're all sort of waiting for that email to come uh, because we were able to run. We started out just doing uh, hurricanes and now we, had, at that point in 2010, we had just implemented day-to-day -day NAM forcing for our, for our model. And uh, we did not get any BP money because they, our lead scientists went into the meeting with BP and BP said, well, if you have something running right now, then we will pay for it. But if you don't have something, don't say, well, we could, you know, we have this and that, it's possible. So we didn't get any BP money, but we did get uh, an NSF rapid grant, and uh, we had a particle tracking code just sorted in our back pocket from other things that we did, and we were able to plug that right in. You can plug in any executable and use it for post-processing. So we were digitizing, we were working for the NASA Center for Space Research at the University of Texas at Austin, and they were digitizing the, the spill outlines, and uh, we were putting into the ASGS and ADSERC, and uh, we had this particle tracking code plugged in, and uh, we're tracking where the spill would go. Now, NOAA does spill and oil tracking all the time. Every day there's a spill of some kind, someplace. They're very good at it. 
but we had something that they did, two things that they didn't have. We had coverage, they had sort of a broad scale uh, implementation, which didn't have any of the back bays in it, and it didn't have tidal currents. Um, and they also didn't have a hurricane vortex model. So they couldn't say if a hurricane comes, what's gonna happen, where is this oil gonna go? So we did, um, as for this NSF rapid grant, we did, what if Hurricane Ike came through? And this was June before they got a cap. And uh, we were able to show that oil would have gone all the way down the coast of Louisiana, all the way to Texas. So um, that's, those are the two capabilities that we had that, that the NOAA spill team um, did not necessarily have. Capability, as I mentioned, Hurricane Matthew and Hurricane Floyd, you might think it's, we want to get total water level from the river all the way to the ocean, and it's harder than you think because these, I know that y'all do a rainfall runoff, but those rainfall runoff models are kinematic and they can't handle backwater effects. We have the river people asking us all the time, hey, we need downstream river boundary conditions for, for our river models. And we say, well, we need upstream river boundary conditions for our coastal model. And, you know, we're trying to connect those up and there's a NOAA um, research effort going on right now. We're looking at a, a Corps of Engineers model called Geisha so that we can get total water level all the way up and down the river based on rainfall. So actionable. We want to produce information that's, that you can make decisions about. This is Hurricane Irene. Uh, the Coast Guard has a command center in Portsmouth, Virginia, and it's in a very vulnerable area of flooding. And so Hurricane Irene was coming, and the decision makers <coughs> at, the, at the Coast Guard were trying to decide, should we coop? Coop is continuity of operations. That means um, if there's going to be damage to their primary command center, they can get on C-130s and fly to a secondary command center in Missouri, and it's very expensive. And so they were looking at the ADSERC results and the timing of, of when a flood might come, and the, it was high resolution. And so they ended up saying, yeah, we're going to coop. So they all got on their planes and they went to Missouri. And uh, the morning that ADSERC said that their, their command center was going to flood, their command center did flood and go offline. But they didn't care because they were in Missouri. So that year, they supported uh, ADSERC in, uh, in terms of running up recommendation for a DHS Science and Technology Impact Award, uh, which was awarded in 2012. So the, the Coast Guard is a, a big fan. In terms of credibility, um, this is what the New York Times was, was saying uh, during Irene. They said, uh, hurricane drives to New York with deadly fury. So you have the, the New York Times hyping up this storm like it's going to be you know, the worst thing that ever happened to anyone. And actually, in the forecast, the Hurricane Center did a really good job of forecasting Irene. But uh, Irene weakened, and it was mostly a rainfall event. And um, it did not, you know, the sub says the subways closed and coasts evacuated as North Carolina bears first blast. So they, they really hyped it up. And so the credibility... You, you spend a lifetime building up your credibility, and then in one event you can lose it. So um, this is the we actually they actually called Rick Ludic, and this is the the storm surge forecast that we produced from AdSurf, and so they printed it in the paper. And uh, so then we had Sandy the next year, and um, they said again the Hurricane Center said Sandy's going to be really bad. It's going to be 12 feet of surge at Battery at the Battery in New York on, on the tip of Manhattan. And uh, everyone thought, oh, well, that's what she said for Irene. And so even though they had good forecasts in both cases and they were accurate, they didn't have the credibility anymore because of, you know, the media can sometimes, uh, you know, they like a good story and sometimes they amp it up a little too much. So we didn't actually have the FEMA Region 2 mesh. At the time, we had our North Carolina mesh. So this was outside of our, our high resolution area, but we were still able to produce some, some good uh, guidance and uh, and uh, a lot of hindcast information afterwards. Uh, Isaac is a storm that went through uh, through Louisiana, and whenever you produce a new model, and you say, we got this new model, it's high resolution, and you're talking to emergency managers, they're like, oh, okay, okay. Well, they're not gonna believe you, you're an academic, they've got you know 20 years of experience doing this, but during uh, Isaac, they were monitoring the results that we were producing, and there's a little town here called Laplace, that flooded and never flooded before. They said, oh, we made it through Rita, we made it through Katrina, we're not gonna flood. And they flooded and that was the only model that predicted it. So now we have a lot of buy-in from, from the state of Louisiana. Uh, I got a random phone. We're starting to get things, you know, the, the, as I said, the flooding and the climate are uh, becoming more unpredictable. We're, I got a call in January of 2016, actually it was New Year's Eve, and they said there's a state of emergency and Mississippi River is flooding 
and uh, they had this spillway, uh, and the spill, the Mississippi River is here, Nor downtown New Orleans is right there, and there's a spillway where they can actually dump water, they can open it, it's only been open seven times in 70 years, they can uh, open the spillway and dump water into Lake Pontchartrain, and that will lower the water levels downstream. And they said, uh, the Corps of Engineers knows how to operate the spillway, they didn't, they didn't need guidance for that, but they said, we want to look at the water levels in Lake Pontchartrain. So I said, okay, sure. Uh, it's New Year's Eve, I have nothing else to do. So let's do this. <laughs> um, you know, it's not even hurricane season, or technically we're not even getting paid for this uh, in particular, but uh, we did it anyway. So this is, the, this is the river, this is the spillway that they can open, and this is the, the well, it's actually the levee that they can, they have basically tree trunks driven into it, and they're called pins, and there's a little railroad train that goes past and pulls them all out, and water goes down the spillway and into the lake. So we said, we had just gotten this capability. You had a question in the back about, can you make these things go up and down? Well, just that summer, the previous six months earlier, we had that capability merged into the latest version of AdCERC where you can actually lower the, the levees uh, in, in the model as the model's running. So we lowered the levee and the water started to flow. Uh, it's called the Bonnie Carey Spillway. And uh, it was flowing into the lake. And if you look, I'm gonna go back and forth. If, so the, so this is it, uh, just as it opens, and if you look at the colors downstream where downtown New Orleans is, you can see they cool off just a little bit cooler as you go downstream. And that's, so we're showing the, the water level in the, in the river is actually going down like you'd expect. And then this happened. And whenever you're doing this in real time, and we had never, I had never even tried this. The guy who wrote this feature, I had never used it. I had to get him on the phone and tell me how to make it work in the code so that we could do this. And so I looked at this, and if you've ever done a model study of anything and you see stuff like that, you're like, oh. Um, so I said, what's, what's going on here? So I took a closer look at it, and I said, well, here's the river. Here's the water level going into the lake. And it doesn't look like numerical instability. It just looks like it's overflowing here. So I thought, maybe this, you know, we're supposed to have all the up-to-date up levee heights, but maybe we don't. Maybe this is actually wrong. So I sent it to the Corps of Engineers. I said, what are we doing wrong here? Do we have the wrong numbers? And it went around their email chain and it came back and they said, no, no, that's, we know about that. That's, that's why we don't open the spillway all the way. <laughs> <laughs> they said that, that was flagged several years ago as being insufficient to carry the full capacity of the spillway. So we don't open this all the way because it was open all the way in the model. And so that's why we don't do that. Um, so that gave us confidence, right? I mean, we have the same bugs in our model that they have in the actual physical levy system. So uh, we were able to re reproduce something that they knew better than to do. So looking at the measured gauge data, um, this is the New Orleans, the New Orleans uh, gauge here. This is the bank full level. So this, is, this blue is what was actually being measured there. So on, on New Year's Day, they're already above the bank full. This orange line here is the New Orleans flood stage. And so they started opening the, the spillway on the 7th. I think they finished it by the 14th. And they just stayed under the flood stage. And so um, we were able to simulate that. They got about 50 centimeters of drop down in that gauge from opening the spillway further upstream. And so we got that same amount of drop down in the model. So that's, those are the kinds of, so these things, we, I gave a talk at the South Florida Water Management District and they have all kinds of problems like this. They have all kinds of floodgates that they open and close, pumps that they turn on and off. They have even bigger problems in New Orleans because the ground water, the ground's porous. So you can't pump water into a reservoir. As soon as the head gets to a certain height, that water will just run right back to the pump underground. And so you just create a circulation because once that head gets to a certain height, the pressure just drives drives it down into the groundwater. So they have even worse problems about containing moving water. So the, these kinds of, the ability to open and close floodgates and turn pumps on and off are useful in a variety of different situations. Hurricane, we hadn't had a big storm since uh, Sandy and then we had Matthew and it hit four different states. And we had issues with water levels set up all along the coast. It's something we've never had to deal with. I've been doing this 12 years. When we started this, we didn't have to deal with persistent water levels set up along the coast. But the Gulf Stream appears to be warming and the way it changes speed causes water levels set up on the coast. So you end up, we were a foot low on Matthew the whole time. It was a foot high a week before the storm hit and was a, a foot high above mean sea level the whole time. 
So we're building in water level data simulation to try to capture some of those effects that are not fully understood or explained yet and are increasing. Um, if you go back to Isabel, it was seven centimeters bias too low. And, and as you go forward in time, every, storm, every, every successive storm that has bias is higher and higher bias. Okay, so th then we get to the 2017 hurricane season, which as you know is epic. Uh, it was, it's been 20 years since uh, we had a major storm in Miami. Uh, it's been 80 years since we had a major storm in, in uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, it's been 10 years since we had a major storm in Texas and we had them all in one year. And so every, everybody, I mean, everybody who does anything related to flooding and storm surge, FEMA, and FEMA still hasn't recovered. I mean, they, they are not, they don't have enough people to cover all the damage and all the, re, you know, all the resiliency and, and all the initiatives that they normally do because no one, no one budgeted for this many events in one year. Here's one you probably don't remember, Tropical Storm Cindy. Uh, there's a ferry service that actually operates uh, the, uh, by the T Department of Transportation in Texas. And the um, Texas Task Force One, or maybe it was the National, I think it was the National Guard, we need, needed to go over to um, Boulevard Peninsula to do a welfare check in advance of this tropical storm coming in. And the DOT has to shut down this ferry if the water gets four and a half feet above tide, you know, normal mean, mean sea level. So they were going to shut down the ferry, which meant that the National Guard was going to have to drive all the way around to get to the peninsula. And so they were looking at the ADSERC results in the State Operations Center in Texas. And we have a sort of an advocate there who's a fan of the AdSurf model, and he said, "No, look at the look at the results. You can you can go to this, and you can actually click. These are all tide gauges. You can click on the tide gauge and show the measured data, and then the AdSurf predictions." He said, "Look at the AdSurf predictions. It's showing the storm is not that bad. It's not going to go above the threshold. You don't have to shut the ferry service down." So they kept it going, and the National Guard was very fortunate. They were very glad they didn't have to divert resources. So model guidance is not always about, oh, it's going to be really bad, you have to evacuate. Sometimes the valuable guidance is, hey, it's not going to be that bad. You don't have to take these, me these measures. You can stay in place and keep your operation going. You don't have to shut down. So it works both ways. Both are, are equally valuable. Hurricane Harvey, uh, the National Weather Service and Corpus Christi didn't know that we were doing this at the time that we were doing it. They found out right after the storm, but they went back and validated the winds and the water levels and found that it validated extremely well. And uh, now when they go out to community groups to explain to them what happened during Harvey, they use, this, they use our website to actually show the water levels because um, it's very user friendly. Hurricane Irma and um, the FEMA said to us, we want you, we need to do a rapid damage assessment. So after the storm passes, so as soon as it makes landfall, we need for you to do a hindcast so we can see where the water come, came up. And it's not just for forecasting. A lot of times the best information they have about what happened comes from a model like this where they can look at peak water levels. And they said, we want to, what we want to do is we want to look at impacts in terms of insurance claims. But we, it's, it goes back to this thing of this model is new and we're not used to this and so we don't think we believe you. So tell you what you do. You go back to Charlie and you use your model and you run a hindcast of Charlie because we, Charlie is 2004 in Florida. And we have a database of actual hurricane claims or insurance claims from Charlie. And so we're going to take your Charlie hindcast and we're going to lay it on top of our claims database map and we're going to see if you're right. And if you're right about Charlie, then we'll, we'll put a lot more stock into your Irma results. So it was another one of these situations where, you know, no one believes you're the new kid on the block and nobody believes you, which, fair enough. Uh, so that's, but they all have their own way of deciding whether they're going to believe it or not. So um, we're working with FEMA. FEMA wants to, um, has expressed interest in having that results in HERAVAC and, uh, and using it for first responders, placing first responders during operations. Maria, uh, the Coast Guard uh, was trying to figure out what to do with their, their, um, uh, their assets, their aircraft assets, and they actually ended up moved, looking at the the model guide, and so it's not just, you know, they're not just looking at the water, they're also looking at the winds that we're generating, because it's based on the official forecast, which is an advantage. So they ended up actually moving aircraft from the Virgin Islands, the same admiral that made the decision to coop in, during Irene in Portsmouth was making this decision as well, and he moved assets into the storm's path in Puerto Rico, because looking at the, at the way the storm, at winds were gonna pass, he said, well, the hangar has the, has the 
door open the other way. So the door's open to the south, and the main winds are going to be coming from the north, so it should be fine. So it raised some eyebrows, but he moved hurricane, the aircraft into the hurricane path, and it turned out really well, So uh, because they had the helicopters right where they needed them after the storm passed. So, um, you know, the greatest model results in the whole world are not going to be worth anything if nobody knows that they're there or nobody knows how to use them or what they mean or what they don't mean. So we've been making site visits. This is Coast Guard Sector houston Galveston, uh, And uh, they, the interesting thing about the Coast Guard is that they cannot, every agency, when you're trying to get operational O&M funding for, for your modeling, every agency has things that they can and can't pay for. The, the Coast Guard said, we can't pay for any wind and water level modeling. We can't. Hurricanes, strong. we have a lot to do during a hurricane, but we can't pay you for that because that's not our, you know, the federal agencies all have to stay in their lane. That's not our lane. That's not what we do. That's the weather service. So we got to talking, and they have um, thousands of above ground storage tanks uh, in the Houston Ship Channel. And if those things are not full, when the water comes up, they can get crushed uh, and stuff can get released, and the stuff that's in them is national security sensitive. In other words, you're not allowed to know what's in them. The Coast Guard can get information about what's in them, but no one that owns those tanks will tell you what's in them. And uh, they actually had a situation where a, a buried storage tank that had natural gas was not not full, and so it was buoyant when the water, you know, the water came over it, it became buoyant, and it popped up out of the water, and a boat hit it, and it exploded like something out of a movie. And then the Coast Guard had to respond to a marine fire. And so we're working with them, and we're going to write a port security grant with them to create a database of where all these assets are, and, uh, and have a crush model. And we're working with Jamie Paget at Rice. And uh, she had her students go through and just from aerial photographs identify 4,000 above-ground storage tanks that could be at risk. So when we're when we're trying to get funding, it's not necessarily the thing that we're used to computing. It's not the impacts, but the consequences that the Coast Guard uh, can potentially fund. Uh, so I want to kind of finish here with talking about the our collaborator. We don't we couldn't do it all ourselves. I, I don't try to do all this stuff myself. It makes perfect sense for us to uh, work with regional collaborators in Texas and here in the Mid Atlantic. So we are working with uh, Celso Ferreira at George Mason, and he's got a Chesapeake Bay flood forecast system. I started working with him when he was still a graduate student. He's a tenured faculty member now. Uh, I've had. He sent two of his students to the Edser Boot Camp training program, that, or two rounds of his students, uh, when it was just in College Park uh, in April. And so uh, we're working with him. Uh, he's got his Chesapeake Bay flood forecast system online. It's cutting edge stuff. I'm super impressed with him and his students. Uh, they've got uh, the Potomac River flood forecast system. He says all the modelers are getting it wrong, and even we could be doing better. Um, so it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, to, to couple a hydrology model, a runoff model, with, with the ADSERC model for, for total water level, but, but they're making fantastic progress. Uh, they're also doing nature-based defenses, you know, nature-based uh, natural uh, resistance to flooding and resiliency uh, measures, like let's build an oyster reef instead of a seawall. So they've got a, a system that's running with X Beach. Uh, and it's using AdCERC and they're measuring in real time, they can measure the effectiveness of different um, natural um, flood, flood resilience uh, measures that have been installed in the Chesapeake. So if you want more information about AdCERC or ASGS that's directly relevant to the Chesapeake, you should talk to Celso Ferreira and I will, I will hand out my business card and you can email me and I'll give you his email address and contact information. So this is my final slide. Um, we don't have as good a community as ROMS, but we are working on it. Uh, we want to have an open community, teaching and learning. Uh, we have community documentation, but it's not that good, and we're, we're working on a wiki right now to improve it. Um, we have, I started the EdSERC Bootcamp in 2010 because I said, I don't have any idea how somebody can use this model if you weren't the graduate student of one of the people who are the founders of this model. And that's, that's Rick Ludic, Johannes Western at Notre Dame, and Glenn Dawson at the University of Texas. If you were one of their graduate students, how would you ever figure this out? So we need to have, uh, we have this training camp and people come and they learn, and, uh, and, um, and we're trying to make it things more user friendly and more, more open as well. So I encourage you to join us. We're going to have more than one per year. It's been one per year up until now. We're gonna start having more than one in the calendar. It was at uh, NSEP in College Park in April. Next year it's going to be in Vicksburg, Mississippi, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. 
So um, I look forward to hearing more about your community and, the, and all the work that you're doing and encourage you to, um, all of our stuff is online, the ASGS is on Git, uh, GitHub, so I encourage uh, collaboration. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Jason. We have time for some questions. Maybe they already got asked in our little hiatus. Uh, it's yeah, the, uh, you, you talked a little bit about Irma, but, but I, I think I'm, I also recall that that was a, uh, a real challenge to forecast the storm surge because it, it shifted a little bit overland to more northerly, and so some of the earlier forecasts or projections were wrong because of the wind direction. Could you say a little bit more about the challenges of dealing with those kinds of yeah. small changes that make big difference? Right, and then the other issue with Irma well, there are several issues, um, is that when it's kind of going up the coast, if it's 10 miles to the east or 10 miles to the west, that totally changes where it's gonna make land from. And so uh, with scenario-based modeling, um, we are showing dire impacts in on the west coast of Florida. But you have to look at, you can't, uh, you, we don't advise the public. We only advise decision makers. And that's because we need to be taught with scenario-based modeling, you need to be talking to someone who knows what they're doing and it's not their first rodeo. Because um, if the storm goes a little bit to the west, then it's, the impacts are totally different than if it goes a little bit to the east. And so what I tell people, the weather service gets really frustrated because when the storm is coming, they're getting requests from emergency managers and mayors and, and uh, all the people who are involved. And uh, they wanna know, where is it gonna go? And that's the one thing that they can't tell them. And so they get really frustrated because they don't even want to provide any kind of guidance, storm surge guidance, because it's like, well, if the storm doesn't go there, then this guidance is pointless, it's gonna be wrong. But my thing is, let's not focus on, on what we don't know, let's focus on what we do know. And my analogy is, Hurricane Rita enters the Gulf. This, the point of uncertainty is so big that if it veers left in five days it's going to be in Mexico and if it veers right in five days it's going to be in the Florida Panhandle. That's how big the cone of uncertainty was. And so we don't know where it's going to go, but we know, what, what do we know? We know somebody's going to get hit in five days. And so my, the way I see it, it's kind of like a crazy guy walks into a bank with a gun and starts waving at all the tellers <laughs> and you know he's only got one bullet and all the tellers want to know, should I duck? Yes, you should. <laughs> Don't, you know, don't stand there thinking, well, there's seven tellers, so there's only one seventh, you know, chance that it's going to be me, so that's too much trouble to duck, and then I'm, that's not me, and I have to get back up again. You know, everybody should duck. You know, wherever you are in that cone, you should, like, if you're in New Orleans, this, when was the last time that oil was changed on this pump? You know, is it leaking coolant? Be doing that. Be doing the things that, that if the storm doesn't come get you, then, well, it's good that you did that anyway. You know, there should be a list of things that you do at five days out if it looks like a significant event that are things that you could be doing anyway and uh, just to make sure you got your ducks in a row. So that's, that's what I, I told weather services. When you don't know where it's going to go, it's kind of perfect because you can encourage everyone to be prepared. But, but also, the, the geography of the Chesapeake makes it particularly prone to the slight deviations yes. of yes. whether you have an Irene wet storm versus uh, 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 Isabel drive and storm surge. So, so, so I guess the, what I'm asking is what, uh, how can we get better at narrowing that? No matter how narrow, because of the, the way the Chesapeake is oriented with the climate, climatological, climatologically typical storm surge or storm tracks, where they're really closely aligned and a little bit of deviation, it's going to be really hard to for the. I mean, the the Hurricane Center is is improving their track forecasts. Intensity is not improving as much, but their track forecasts are getting better and better every year. Using historical statistics, the, the cone of uncertainty gets smaller and smaller. But that's something that is going to be really hard. I mean, that's just a really hard problem to solve for the Chesapeake, um, and it's it's just because of the nature of the where this tracks go and the orientation of the bay, it's it's going to be hard to solve that. So it's just be over-prepared, it's really the only thing you can do. All right, uh, one more quick question, Larry. Are, are you using, is there a, a separate wave model that, like, that couples with that circuit or is there one built in the answer? So we, 
uh, have, we couple with SWAN, and uh, so the SWAN is the wave model we use, and actually they run inside the same executable. There's no, it's not using ESMF or anything like that. They're running on the same finite element mesh. Okay. And so that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it that's coming online through ESMF, we have ST-Wave already through ESMF, and the Corps of Engineers did the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study with, with ST-Wave and AdCERC coupling. And then in the next version of AdCERC, in version 54, we're going to have uh, AdCERC and Wave Watch 3 coupling through ESMF. All right. Thank you very much, Jason. With that, I think we'll go to lunch. And